All right, guys. Um, thank you uh, so much for being here today. Um, we will travel far and wide. I'm normally used to doing a lot of these presentations in America in front of American audiences, but half the time I'm repeating myself because they don't understand my accent. So all my Scottish people here <laughs> make me feel like I'm, it's, a, it's a homecoming. And I want to thank Suzanne and Fiona. We met last year at the Drug Policy Alliance Conference, I think October in Atlanta. And um, you know, we kind of talked about coming here and doing some sort of event around uh, advocacy. The weather got in the way last month. The beast released, is that what you call it, wasn't it? Got in the way, but I managed to get rescheduled, come in last night, hang out with Fiona and her dogs, and, uh, and here we are today. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's the presentation for, I've, I've come with a presentation that's kind of, I guess, like based on conversations that I've had with Fiona and Suzanne, what you guys might be interested in. But really, this is all about like what you guys need and what you guys want and, and what you guys want to learn. And so it can be, I'll go through my slides, but if it's, you know, uh, people want to jump in with questions, it can be quite informal, I guess is what I'm saying. You know, jump in with questions, feel free to stop me. What does this mean? What does that mean? If I'm using too many, American words can also slag me off and tell me that I've lost my roots and all that sort of stuff. Um, but, um, and I'll, I'll try and keep an eye on the time as well. I think we've got till one, is that right? 12, but there's flexibility there. But the got to 12, sorry, I'm, I'm still, my watch is still, okay. So I've got to 12, right, okay. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll like jump in with questions, like feel free to, you know, stop me at any point in the presentation. And if uh, people start fainting and passing out, that means we'll stop for lunch, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, like, as I said, the presentation is, you know, aimed at sort of like, uh, you know, helping you guys learn more about, you know, advocacy and specifically um, advocating to end the drug war. Um, so my name is Michael Collins and I am originally from Glasgow, from the south side of Glasgow, um, for folks that know Glasgow from the area and um, I have spent the last 10 years or so living in the US specifically living in Baltimore I work at Drug Policy Alliance um, in Washington DC in the, the, the national office and um, one of the reasons I've been able to come here today is because I'm currently living just outside of Barcelona I'm spending a year with my wife and kids kind of doing like a year out, a sabbatical year where I'm doing some research and drug policy in Spain, which I'll talk a little bit about what I'm doing in Spain. But my wife works with, uh, you know, in Baltimore doing like harm reduction and overdose prevention, that kind of stuff. And so she's doing research in, in Barcelona on harm reduction. And so um, we're there until the end of May, which is the day we leave, just to hop on a wee easy jet flight across to spend the day with you guys. Um, Cool. So I'm going to start off just by talking about my organisation, Drug Policy Alliance, which is the largest drug policy organisation in the world, I think, but certainly in America. It started around about sort of 20, 25 years ago by a guy called Ethan Nadelman. And the main you know, objective of the organisation is to end the war on drugs, right? So there's obviously a different context for the war on drugs, but within the United States itself, you know, war on drugs is basically rooted not only in a war against people who use drugs and people who sell drugs, but specifically against communities of colour, black people, Latinos, immigrant populations as well. And I think a lot of what Drug Policy Alliance tries to do is sort of change, specifically change laws. You know, we're not an organisation that necessarily puts out reports. We're not an organisation, you know, that does kind of marches or demonstrations or that sort of stuff, although I'm being contradicted by people <laughs> demonstrating in this picture. But... Normally what our bread and butter is, is sort of going up to parliaments and legislatures and, and actually trying to change laws. And so some of the, the, the stuff that we've done has been focused on marijuana legalization or cannabis legalization as we call it here in the UK. Um, specifically passing laws and passing referendums. Many of you will know that now in the United States there are nine states that have marijuana legalization where you can go into shops and buy marijuana legally um, and there are a number of states that have medical marijuana or more than I think 30 states over half the country have medical marijuana 
We also have done a lot of work on harm reduction, overdose prevention, you know, spreading things like naloxone, syringe exchanges, those kind of things throughout the US. Like, but almost always like passing laws. Like we're not the guys handing out the naloxone, we're not the guys like working in the syringe exchange, but we're the guys that will get the law passed so that we will then do it. So that's a lot of what the presentation is going to focus on today is actually specifically how you change a law, right? You don't a lot of us don't like the laws in this country. Um you know, especially as they relate to drugs, and so how do you go about changing these laws? And so, if we can move to the next slide. My job is basically, um, we have an office in Washington, D.C. that specifically deals with Congress and the White House, and so all. the work is around trying to get Congress and trying to get the, the kind of national level government to change laws. So I work a lot on marijuana legalization, so trying to like nationally legalize marijuana in the US and allow um, what the states are doing to kind of proliferate. Um, also, I do a lot of work on sentencing reform. As many of you know, the, the US has very, very harsh laws when it comes to drugs. They have a huge incarceration problem, a huge incarceration population. So a lot of my job is kind of like trying to reduce sentences as it relates to drugs. Um, I do some international work, actually. I'm an international relations master's degree person. You can recover from that. But I still do <laughs> some of the foreign policy stuff every now and again as it relates, because the US is not only they're very good at doing the drug war domestically, they're also very good at exporting the drug war to places like Latin America and, and, and various other countries. So a lot of the day-to-day -day is what I do is kind of trying to be like proactive in terms of like advancing drug policy reform, but especially some of you might have heard we have this new president, um, his name's Donald Trump, and he's not really our kind of guy. I think he's not a lot of people, well, he obviously is a lot of people's kind of guy, that's how he got elected. But he's not our cup of tea, and, um, you know, one of the challenges is, like, he's a very, uh, he's a lot of things, but he's a very tough on crime guy. He's, a, he's, a, he's what we call Glasgow Heart Man. Um, you know, he's the kind of guy who, you know, he loves, like, being seen with the police, and he loves being tough tough on immigrants and tough on criminals. And a lot of that means, you know, he has a lot of like negative proposals when it comes to the drug war. And so, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you know, he decided to say that like, it would be a good idea if America could, uh, you know, have the death penalty for drug dealers and stuff like that. So while a lot of the, the work is kind of being proactive in terms of trying to advance our agenda, you're also responding to you know, some of the crazy things that, 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 that politicians will say, including especially now Donald Trump, and also trying to be, you know, like reactive and trying to like defeat and prevent, you know, bad things from happening. Um, so right now I'm in Spain working, I still do some work with Drug Policy Alliance, I'm doing some sort of like academic reports um, on different aspects of drug policy. But one of the things I do is I'm working with this Spanish drug policy organisation. I was just meant to talk about this this morning to, um, Hannah, sorry. Anna. Anna, sorry. Um, terrible memory. And so what I'm what I'm doing with them is they're a traditionally very sort of academic drug policy organization that put out reports and um, you know, do all these sorts of events, but they're very well not very adept at doing advocacy. And so I'm designing a sort of like advocacy campaign for them, especially as it relates to cannabis, like how do you pass laws? And so I say that because despite the fact that I've spent you know, a lot of time working in the US um, and, and obviously the, the political system here is very different. Like one of the things that I'm trying to I'll show today is a lot of the stuff that we do is fairly universal and fairly transferable in terms of how it can apply to the UK. So I try, I try and stay away from like stuff that's specific to American politics and try and keep it kind of to things that will help you guys in your everyday campaigns. So, Who's that handsome guy? Um, today's presentation, I'm going to be running through, uh, you know, a number of different, you know, talking points. But it kind of boils down to the first thing is kind of like understanding politicians, so the main people that you interact with when you're trying to change laws. Then I'll talk a little bit about how you actually move legislation. What are the things that you need to do? Then, as I mentioned before, part of the job is not only being like proactive, but also being defensive and sort of trying to. Stop legislation. I'll get into a little bit about meeting politicians, how you go about conducting yourself 
not like I take it or anything like that because I don't really care about that. More about like sort of the talking points and the things that you need to raise. I think probably a couple of people this morning that have needs coming up with politicians and political officials. Then a large part of the conversation is going to be what I think is a kind of overlooked aspect of advocacy, which is like using the media, right? I think you were saying this morning, like, don't have any trust in the media and all that sort of stuff. I, I, I totally agree with you, but I think there are lots of ways. Part of advocacy is meeting with the politicians and trying to talk to them, you know, in a space like this, you know, behind closed doors. But a lot of what is successful advocacy, in my opinion, is when you can like successfully use the media. Um, Know, for your for your own gain, um, and so I'm going to try and talk about that, and then I'll talk a little bit about a you know successful campaign that we had in the US and kind of putting some of this sort of stuff into practice. So again, before I kick things off, like you know, stop me if you've got any questions. Put your hand up, shout out, um, and, and 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 you know, I'll try and make this as informal as possible. So as I said before, um, you know the 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 other here leaders holding hands together, the special relationship. Oh, yeah, um, you know the US and the UK political systems are like very different. Obviously, one of the key differences is like the US has a Congress that's very independent from you know the the, the president. The president is not necessarily the leader of the uh, the main political party, right? And so. One of the things we can do in Congress is like, even though Trump is a disaster for us, we can still go and work with Republicans that can push back against what he wants to do. And, you know, you can peel people off and we can go and work with Democrats. And the Congress is not necessarily beholden to what he wants to do. In the UK, it's a little bit different where the, the, the sort of head of parliament is the prime minister. The prime minister is the leader of the party that has, you know, the most seats in parliament. And the prime minister often gets to do what he or she wants to do. So the systems are very different. But again, as I said before, what I'm going to try and do today is try and keep it like high level as possible and talk about some of the things that are more universal things that will work in the US and I think will work uh, in, in, in the UK as well. So the overall objective here is, you know, I'm not trying to sort of, um, you know, we, where we measure our success at Drug Policy Alliance at DPA is like, are we changing laws? You know, I mean, we don't sort of look at it as like, did we change the conversation? Did we change the rhetoric? Did we we're actually like, did a law get passed? Right? We go, we introduce bills, we do legislation, we have referendums, we do that sort of stuff. And at the end of the day, you win or you don't win. It's very easy to measure, right? Sometimes success is hard to measure. You know, am I having an impact? Am I changing people's minds? In my line of work, it's quite easy to measure. You know, either a bill, will pass, a piece of legislation will pass, it will be signed into law, it won't have stopped a le bad legislation from passing or I haven't. You know, when I go and talk to my boss, I don't sort of talk about like, well, you know, I've changed the conversation on marijuana or something like that. He wants to know, like, did you get the law passed? You know, and that's sort of the metric. And so a lot of things, this is one of the other main organizations that works in the US on uh, marijuana reform. And they, their slogan is, we change laws because they are not a think tank, right? They're not sort of um, an organisation that's kind of academic in nature. They go and they pass laws, and that's kind of what I'll be talking about today. That's the kind of main objective here. We have, you know, either in some cases very like you know shitty laws, very crappy laws that we want to change, we want to make better, or you know we have proposals to make laws even worse, right? Than they already are just now that we want to stop, right? Like the death penalty before. So that's kind of like in a nutshell what the overall objective of, of, of my work is. And you know, you have a lot of people who are sort of like, you know, your your kind of uh, thought leaders in drug policy and the guys that are coming up with it, the, the big ideas about the safe injection facility here and the new, you know, with the checkpoint program someone was talking about. I'm not that guy who's going to come up with the idea for like a checkpoint program or a safe injection space. I'm not the guy who's writing the academic paper. But I'm the guy who will take, tell me about your idea and I'll make it happen, right? Tell me about the checkpoint idea and I'll see what the legal obstacles are. And a lot of like what passing legislation is about, it's like a big game of chess, right? Where you're on one side of the board and you're just really trying to figure out how do I get from here, which is like the law is how it is, how do I get to there? And you're kind of like devising your, there we go, uh, devising the, the strategy. Oh, 
here he comes, my special guest. Um, uh, a lot of it's like a big game of strategy where you're just trying to get from like one side to the other and, 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 and you're trying to do it as best as possible. Go ahead. Uh, just in this world of law, yes. how easy do you think it is for someone like me who doesn't have any understanding of the law yeah. to get to grips with that kind of material that you're working with? Well, I, I will say that I have like zero legal background. I watched Alan McNeil a lot when I was younger. <laughs> I had the box set, it's a very good show. But apart from that, I really don't have any law experience at all. I got maybe if that counts. But, uh, you know, I. I it does work a lot with lawyers, but what lawyers try to do is like they'll draft the law and they'll sort of get into the legal nitty gritty. And again, I always think like if I could go back in time, no offense to the international relations degree, but I think I would do a law degree again because I think it would be helpful for this work. Having said that, like law and sort of legal, being a lawyer is all about sort of like evidence, right? And showing like here's the evidence for this, right? This works. Therefore, let's do it, right? Your Honour, the jury, like, okay, tell me not guilty. You show the evidence, right? Politics is not, I want to make this, it's a very important talking point that I always use. Politics is not evidence based. Politicians do not respond to evidence. If they responded to evidence, they would have solved, like, climate change and inequality and also, there's all sorts, that's what I mean, like, they don't respond to that. Politics is a different game altogether, right? They don't care about a report that has like the best footnotes in the world and the font size is perfect and it's written by the biggest academic. They don't really, they, they don't generally care about that. They care about other things, which I'm going to get into what motivates them, right? But evidence is, I don't want to say evidence is not important because obviously you want to have the evidence on your side, but we're all working in an area where I think we safely say the evidence is on our side. Like the drug war isn't working, drug policy in the UK and the US isn't working. Right? Why is it not changed? It's not because there's a lack of evidence. Every day there's a new study or a new report about, you know, overdoses going through the roof or like, you know, cannabis prohibition isn't working and the law stays the same. So you've got to think at some point politicians, they don't really respond to evidence and that's something that I'll hopefully cover. But it's a very, it's one thing I want to take away from today. It's like, you know, I worked with this, uh, this woman once who was a lawyer. She kept working her organization and she was very you know legalistic in terms of how she presented things and she found the work very challenging because i very rarely go into meetings with politicians and talk about you know studies and evidence and stuff like that and more use like other talking points which i'll get into um to get my point across you know because they don't really respond to evidence they respond to other things does that answer your question yes yes Regarding the law in the UK or in Scotland, what type of law? Do you do? Yeah. I was wondering whether you're touching that or if you could touch that. Or you yeah, to yeah, I'm happy to touch yeah. it. I mean, I, I would say, like, I'm not the uh, UK or, or Scottish legal expert. I, I'll use, like, what I know, but feel free to, like, jump in and correct me. But I've, as I said before, this isn't a presentation that's about, like, moving a law in the UK Parliament. I think I do use a lot of, like, British politicians' pictures. But, um, it's supposed to be quite universal. It's quite high level in the sense of like, I don't, I don't get into like the kind of House of Lords and this peer and that peer. I don't, I don't even know a lot of that stuff myself. So it's more about like, here are some things that universally you should be able to use, whether you're in Scotland, whether you're in Spain, whether you're in London, it, it doesn't really matter. So that's the intention. And hopefully, obviously, if, if there are specific questions about Scotland, um, you know, I think you might be a better place to answer them than me. But if, you're going to do that in the afternoon. Aye. Kind of workshop. Oh, yeah, that's right. Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the Scottish Parliament issue. Anyway, okay. So, what motivates uh, politicians, right? So, this is one of the things, right? The, 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 main, the main person, when you try to change a law, right? The main person that you're trying to convince is, is a politician or a set of politicians. So, I think it's very important to understand, right? what motivates them. And I said before, like, it isn't really, like, the evidence, right? Because they, 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 they care about certain things. And so one of the things they care about is getting re-elected, right? They don't want to, that's their job, right? They want to stay in the job. They want to get re-elected. So they're not likely to do anything that is going to cost them re-election. So, as, you know, Boris Johnson, right, he might read a study about 
you know, legalising heroin and how it's, you know, the best thing for the UK and it's going to solve the overdose crisis and, you know, something like that. He's never going to come out from that because he's like, this is going to kill me politically, right? And that's what I mean about the difference between the evidence and the politics. It's just a different world that you're operating in, right? And so often, they either want to be re-elected, right? And sometimes, you know, you get people like in, in the UK or in the Scottish Parliament that are in, like, safe seats and so they don't really... They can do what they like. I mean, that's becoming less and less the case, I think, in the UK with the concept of kind of what seats being up for grabs. But they're very concerned about, like, they will do whatever it takes to get re-elected, right? They won't say anything that goes against the grain. And then often they, um, you know, they want to move up the ladder of the party and become, like, a secretary, a member of the cabinet, stuff like that. And a lot of that is about keeping your nose clean and being like non-controversial and being the kind of guy that follows the party line and salutes the leader and all that sort of stuff. Um, I'll, I'll just add to that. Go ahead. With, with the Only Ones Child campaign, we're very active with politicians in the UK. Yeah. And there's a third thing I've noticed with politicians and senior police too, which is personal experience. Yeah. And a lot of them do have personal experience okay. of addiction or yeah. overdose. And yeah. that's also something to be aware of and yeah. tap into Definitely. too. Um, yeah, I know that's a very important point as well, um, because they bring the sort of, and we were talking about this today, a lot of people, like, regardless of whether a politician or not, will bring their personal experience to the table, and sometimes that's not evidence-based, you know, like, oh, I, I stayed near a methadone clinic and it was horrible, or some, or my dad, you know, used drugs or something like that, and it's, the personal experience is important as well to understand, because it just understands, like, they may have some, like, you know, like, built-in feelings, but, um, I, again, like politicians, I hope no one in the room is like related to a politician, but politicians are really terrible people, right? They're not sort of like, <laughs> they're really lost people. I mean, they get into the job, I think 99% of the people are there for their ego, right? They want to kind of like be, you know, they watch like these, these TV shows and they want to be on Prime Minister's questions and they want to be the top dog in the party and all that. And they just really want to do anything that will help them rise to the top. Um, some politicians are like in it for like, you know, you'll meet politicians that really care about the issues and really care about, like, uh, you know, social change and justice or whatever. But in my experience, you know, they're few and far between. The majority of them are in it for, like, you know, the ego and the, the, the attention and, and kind of, uh, you know, moving up that in power. They want power, right? And, and they want to have that kind of the rush that comes with power. And so the, 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 the kind of counter to that is what they don't want is bad media coverage, right? They don't want to be in the media getting bad. You know, they hate it, right? And they hate anything negative being said about them because that's going to affect them getting re elected, that's going to affect them like moving up the ladder. And so they're always very paranoid about, you know, bad media, media coverage. And then obviously, they don't want to lose elections, which is an obvious point. For these people. And another thing is, they don't really, in my experience, like some of them are really hard workers, but some of them, you know, they don't want to work too hard. And so that's important when you're thinking about meetings, right? With them when you're thinking about working with politicians. My experience is you need to sort of do a lot of the work for them. You can't say to them like, hey, you know, go away and read this like 50 page report on, you know, cannabis legalization or something like that. They're not going to do that. You know, they don't work that hard on those issues. And they cover a lot of different things, God bless them. But they're not going to do that. So a lot of it is like you have to think as an advocate about like how can you be helpful, right? How can you make their lives easier and how can you make them, you know, uh, pay attention to your issue, knowing that they're not going to go away necessarily and go and read the latest, like, transform report or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so I'll, I'll get into a lot of that when, when people talk to those people as well. So this is kind of like the nitty gritty of trying to, like, pass legislation. So you try to get a bill passed, right? So the important thing is kind of, Initially, is like picking an issue, right? Choosing whatever issue. And sometimes the issue maybe picks you, you know, not necessarily like choosing an issue. But you have to pick, you know, an area of the law that you see something you don't like and you want to change it, right? And it's, it's again, like, I think it's always a good idea to pick something that is, um, you know, near and dear to your heart because you might spend a lot of time working on it. But it's also a good idea to pick something that is, like, politically possible, right, within the realms of possibility that you might actually be able to get something moving on this, um, because otherwise you'll have a, a, a problem doing a lot of the other stuff that I'm going to talk about. And then I think you need to find someone who's going to be your champion on the issue, and so that's, you know, like a, uh, an 
from a specific politician or set of politicians that you can work with that will you know introduce your legislation that will help write the legislation for you that will get the thing moving and this is a picture of like two politicians in the US that I worked with on medical marijuana on the left is Cory Booker um, he's a senator from New Jersey, he's a Democrat, Rand Paul is a Republican from Kentucky and Kirsten Gillibrand. Um, and they're all pretty like within US politics, pretty like high profile people. <coughs> but this guy here, <coughs> he cares a lot about you know criminal justice reform and the impact of the war on drugs on people of colour. So it's good to do the work with him, he's definitely passionate about it. This guy is like a, a libertarian, which Bill and I were talking about last night, which is kind of doesn't fully exist in the, the in, in, in UK politics, but it's kind of like nobody should be telling me what to do with my body and keep the government out of my life. But he's a Republican, and then this um, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand is, is is from New York, and she was very impacted by um, mothers of you know uh, kid, kid mothers of, 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 of kids who were using uh, cannabis for epilepsy and for really severe seizures and stuff like that so she got involved in there and they became sort of like three of them together we worked with them over a number of months on sort of drafting legislation and, and, and putting the kind of like and again not a lawyer so I just kind of like broad strokes with what we worked on with them but um, they were very passionate about the issue and this is them like doing a press conference about it and, 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 and they were very good at sort of championing the issue and I think you know you can find you know the, the kind of MP that's like, I, I'll do it and like, I'll chuck it in and whatever and never work on the issue. But it's always good to find someone who actually cares a little bit about the issue for whatever. And these are three people who care about the issue for, for medical cannabis for different reasons, but they all kind of came together and that was a pretty successful campaign. <clears throat> so then when you talk about, it's one thing to kind of draft the legislation and work with them about like the plan about what's going to be in the actual legislation. And then there's the introduction of the legislation, right? And you're talking about, um, you know, working with politicians to get attention on the legislation that you're introduced. Because a lot of legislation might not go anywhere, right? It might just end up sort of sitting in someone's desk somewhere in some parliamentary office. But you want to sort of like drive the conversation forward, right? And that medical marijuana bill that we introduced didn't actually go anywhere. It's still sort of like pending, you know, hearings and all that sort of stuff. But those three senators like coming together, they did like a big press conference, um, and it got just like tons of media, like in all the big newspapers in the US, and it was kind of like catching lightning in a bottle. And I'll get into more about the importance of the media, but doing like a press conference, right, where media can come up and ask questions and write stories about this, that will get your message out there. Because I mean, I, I don't, God knows how many pieces of legislation get introduced every day, and if they're not covered in the media, often you know there's no attention on them whatsoever. Um, then you're sort of like, uh, you're talking about getting more support from other politicians for your legislation. So then, and I'll get into this later, but um, you know, you've sort of drawn up a list of other people that could support your legislation, whatever it is, if it's cannabis, like who else supports cannabis or who else, you know, what from what other parties could you go and visit and meet with to get support? And then I think like being diverse, right? If you pick people from the same party for an issue, it becomes like, partisan issue, right? It becomes like a Labour issue or a Conservative issue or an SNP issue. But if you have like, you know, on your legislation, a guy from the Lib Dems and a woman from Labour and, you know, it makes things look like, oh, this has like broad support and also like the media love that kind of broad bipartisan different parties supporting. Um, so those are kind of some of the things you would do when you're introducing legislation. Um, and then when you're trying to like move the legislation itself, um, what you need to do is really like figure out who are the key players, right, that are going to move your legislation. And a lot of this, you're going to have to work with the politician that you originally introduced the bill with. But, you know, who said, like, okay, this bill is going to go through the health committee, right? How do you get the bill moving in the health committee? Who do you talk to in the health committee? You know, can you go and visit with them? Do you know anybody that can talk to them? That sort of stuff. And you're kind of like, I talked before about like a game of strategy. Right, your first sort of strategy is sort of working out, okay, who am I going to get to introduce the bill? Then you're trying to figure out, okay, how do I move this another few pieces down the chessboard? Who's on the committee? 
who's influential on this issue, who cares about this issue. And you're talking about like, um, you know, doing like hearings, for example, through a committee process and um, then getting some like time to actually consider the legislation on the floor, learning like intelligence about who likes the bill and who doesn't like the bill. Um, and you know, I, again, I said before, I'm not going to try and get into the weeds of like the legislative process because it's so different in, you know, Scotland to London to Spain to the US, but these are just some of the kind of like in broad strokes, some of the universal things that you need to do to, to move legislation or move policy. Then you talk about like other advocacy tools that are outside of like, uh, you know, actually introducing the legislation and doing the kind of, ins there's a kind of inside game, right? Where you're inside the parliament and you're trying to meet with the politicians and meet with the staff and all that sort of stuff. And then there's sort of outside tools, right? Where you, maybe you do like a sign on letter from different groups in support of your legislation and you send it to the politicians or you, um, you know, you target certain people with a letter of support from a different number of groups. That's a common tool we'll use, you know, meeting with politicians and key players, which I touched on before, but I'll try and get into more detail about this later. That's a very important thing. What we call like a lobby day, where some of you may have done that, where you get like a group of people and you sort of descend on the parliament and you go for a whole day and you just do like a series of different meetings with politicians on the bill. And again, you're always trying to get them to like support the legislation or sign on or do something like cause a meet. Um, so those are some, some of the other advocacy tools. And then other things that you need, I think, for a successful campaign, right? I mean, and again, specifically the campaign is trying to pass, pass a piece of legislation. So like, you always need people who are impacted by the issue. So, you know, if it's a drug policy issue, like having drug users at the table, people who, you know, are in recovery or currently using drugs, they can talk specifically about the issue from the heart. It's very powerful. Like, I'm just, you know, I go to Congress and I'm just this like, Scottish guy that shows up to talk about drug policy. But we will often, you know, bring with us and work with <coughs> other drug users or people affected, mothers, parents, you know, whatever, um, that can really bring home the issue and have that, some, I think you mentioned personal contact, have that sort of personal contact that maybe me, you know, being sort of not personally impacted myself by an issue, like you can really bring that home. It's complicated for quantitative research stigma to stand up and say I'm a drug user. Yep, it seems I, lazy, it seems convenient, it seems self-serving. So yeah. in some ways, uh, the people who are related to drug users rather than drug users themselves can be more effective. Than yeah, well, I mean, it depends because I think with drug users as well, you can counteract that stigma, right? If you're someone who, like we will do a lot of lobby days, like before with drug users themselves, talking about things like harm reduction, and they go in and they have that personal story. And not only do they have the personal story, but for the politician, it's interesting. Like, oh, I thought a drug user was like some guy who's like a loser on the street. You know? And you're sort of counteracting that image as well. And I think that's that's very important. Um, then you move on to sort of like other things that you should, should have, that you, that, that you, you don't need, but are useful to have as part of a campaign or kind of like prominent spokespeople, right? If you can get, um, you know, a celebrity to sort of endorse your position, um, you know, like we've worked over the years with like different celebrities and it's a good way of getting media attention as well. And I know it's like, it's not like I have a Rolodex of like, call Rihanna up and see if she wants to support my organization. But there's sometimes like, for example, with like, we worked with, uh, <coughs> with Jay-Z the rapper on like criminal justice reform. We've worked with like Elton John on like HIV and AIDS and stuff like that. Not me personally. Who I am, but our organization has worked with these people over the years, and it's always good because, like, it's good for the media. The politicians are always like tickled if you bring in like celebrities and stuff like that. Um, other people are like, when you're talking about like drug, po drug policy and drugs as like a medical issue, I think having people who have like credibility around that issue, like doctors, nurses, medical officials, to the extent that they can come in and say, like, we support this, law enforcement is another constituency that, that whether you like it or not, politicians will pay attention to. And so if you can have these sort of like prominent spokespeople that you can deploy in meetings, in the media, in your press conferences, then it's going to help move your agenda forward. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the media strategy. Um, I think having, I mentioned this before, but having politicians that you're working with on this issue that are your sponsor of the bill, that have introduced the bill, that are like committed and passionate and care about the issue 
um, I think that's very important rather than someone who's just sort of like doing this for the sake of it because at the end of the day it's going to be the politician that drives the issue forward so if you can find somebody <coughs> that like really cares deeply about this issue and really cares personally about it perhaps then I think that's always helpful then <coughs> also like people who are like connected to politicians whether they're donors or you know um you know, people who are like somehow no politicians are connected to that world at all to talk to politicians even in sort of private capacity. And again, like I know I put Bono on there talking like I know people probably don't have Bono's phone number to call them up, like you help me with my legislation. But these are things that are kind of like aspirational. It doesn't have to be, you know, the most prominent celebrity in the world. It does you don't have to have these things, but these are things that we thought about that are useful in um advocacy campaigns we have, but are by no means like essential. The other things I'm going to talk about later around the media for me are, are, are more essential. What was actually Bono supporting then? Yeah. He was supporting the war in Iraq. No, he wasn't. Uh, <laughs> he was uh, supporting um, more spending on HIV and AIDS prevention in Africa. So George W. Bush in his second term like championed uh, more spending on international aid for emergency uh, HIV and AIDS, and Bono was a big champion of it as well. So they were best buddies, I guess. Do you find that that's a kind of double-edged sword? Because if you get, I mean, politicians are ego-driven. Yep. Well, I mean, these guys are even worse. And I mean, we get that with the recovery movement. Do you know? Russell Brand is like, do you want to or do you not want yeah, to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of it's just about how do you manage them. You have to make your own choice about like, are they helping or hindering the campaign? You know. Um, so I really feel like something Michael Barrymore. I thought he did more damage than good to the recovery. Yeah. You know, because he came out and wrote a book, and then obviously the rest is history. And and and, you know, I'm just thinking about that family who's come today has touched me so much more than I think anything yeah. else would. You know, I'd love the opportunity to speak to us later. You know, and I think that is the magical thing that happens when somebody comes to complain. Yeah. Individuals connect. Uh -huh. We don't experience this. We don't connect. Yeah. And and I think that's the powerful thing about that. Yeah. Because it's it's quite interesting to just I, I don't want to take you off the No 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 in ahead. Scotland obviously for the for those that maybe don't know we have a policy we're deadly lucky in Scotland recovered so we actually have a recovery policy that's just been refreshed now after 10 years but what i found really interesting was we assume that everybody knows about campaigns and policies and and actually they don't and sometimes even the politicians don't mm -hmm. and we have done campaigns at government um, and they've been really successful but we, we did it i always think there's that shimmy goes on you know it's what is it that i call it the fresh shimmy that people have with that nice face <laughs> they're not getting, they're not getting to the meat yeah. of it, yeah. and I, 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 find it very uncomfortable mm -hmm. working with people that are up there, mm -hmm. and I, and I would really want to get down there and yeah. really find out what's going on. Yeah. Um, but what we did was did a quiz, a cheeky chappy quiz, uh -huh. actually all about their policies, okay. to see <laughs> what they knew and asked the the, the questions, and it, it's amazing even people in recovery were getting it wrong. Right. Because we're working on these assumptions, it's yeah. interesting. But yeah, yeah, because you just don't have a policy here, don't you? Know, that thing in Sheffield, you know, you've got a policy, and, you know. So, we're doing good, Liam and Campbell, our Minister for Health is a post exchange, that's made a difference, mm -hmm. I think, for us moving from criminal justice to health. Mm -hmm. That was a huge step. Yeah. Um, it does mean that the focus on a particular kind of focus on a particular kind of person does mean that the other forms of focus on criminal system are perceived as a distraction of the decision to go campaign. This is a, is that because reserve nature of involvement yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Scotland's very different from well, yeah. Yeah. well I mean I two two things to pick up on that. I mean I think like the, the point about celebrities a lot of this is like double edged sword, you know, the celebrities, the polit politicians themselves are celebrities, like that's kinda like talked about ego and, and, and earlier on and they're driven by the same things and you know, it's, it's just your own judgment about if you can use them in a way that's like helpful for your campaign, or if like Russell Brand or whatever has been like you know a pain in the bum, then obviously you know you don't you don't use them. And again, like it's sort of like we've used. Uh, I it's, 
it's not the way it, it's not the world I would like to live in. But unfortunately, like some people pay more attention to you know what Rihanna says about drug policy or Jay Z says about criminal justice than you know what I say. You know, <laughs> obviously, like more talented than me for starters. But like people, you reach a different audience, right? You know, you reach somebody who like follows everything Jay Z has to say, and you know, even on Twitter, like get people so to like tweet out likes to your information is is helpful in kind of reaching a broader audience. And again, like we've gone into meetings with like celebrities and stuff like that. Um, sometimes you can't control what they're going to say, but you find that they're sort of like you know going in the right direction. Can, it can be helpful and it can be impactful and again yeah. again I, I just want to stress like i'm not saying like if you don't have bono on your side forget about your campaign you know these guys are not essential like the requirements are not necessarily like you must have them but I, I find them just to be different tools that you can employ and are helpful the other thing i'll say about and i hope we get into this a little bit more but a point that you, that, that you raised anna was um, i think always in advocacy there's a big difference between advocacy and like activism, right? And I, I think I kind of talk about this at the end, but I can mention <coughs> it now. For me, like sort of advocacy is kind of being inside the room, right? And sort of making the deal. Activism is kind of you're outside and you have an ideal state and it's you know, I want mm -hmm. this thing and it's it has to be exactly this way. And if not, you know, you can go to hell. I mean I'm exaggerating, right? And I think there's a very, very powerful and useful place for activism within you know the drug policy movement and but advocacy is very different because quite often what you're doing is you're having to make these decisions about like i'm not getting exactly what i want but am i getting enough of what i want to move forward and these are there's no exact science over it right these are decisions about like i think marijuana is like a good example right in the us when they started legalizing medical cannabis in 1996 a lot of people were outraged, like, why are you doing medical? Like, this is crazy. We need to do recreational and why that's a half loaf and this is going to be a setback for the movement. And a lot of the activist people were against medical cannabis legalization because they didn't think it was going to lead to recreational. Now it's turned out that actually like medical cannabis in a lot of states has led to people being comfortable with the concept of cannabis and like therefore um you know that 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 you can uh you can say that was like a successful deal that was made or a compromise that was made to support medical cannabis. On the flip side, you have things like drug courts, right? Well, I think at the time, and we talked about this last night, people would say like, this is a, a drug court is a great step in the right direction because, you know, you're getting people into treatment and they're not going to jail and stuff like that. But now you sort of look like sort of 10, 15, 20 years on, like drug courts, was that a deal that was worth making? You know, like, has that been the right solution? Has that actually set back the drug policy movement by keeping drugs in the criminal justice arena? And so these are very, you know, the thing about like Checkpoint, for example, as well, and some of these other diversion programs that are law enforcement focused, it's a very hard decision as an ad, as someone in the advocacy community to try and figure out like when you're making progress and when you're actually like set. Sometimes it's, it's just not easy. But you also have, I always think like if, Legislation and advocacy can be very frustrating because it's so incremental. But for me, as long as we're like going along the right path, I will say yes to what the deal is. As long as it's moving me, but if it's, if I think it's going to move me backwards, or I think it's going to move our issue backwards, you know, I'll say no. And so that's one of the problems with like operating in the arena of politics versus and advocacy versus activism. Politics is a dirty game. It's all about deal making and take you know, take this deal instead of that deal and like, well, I won't support this, but I'll support half of that. And if you, you know, it's all those sort of crappy things that you see uh, on TV, you read about in the newspapers and why people, why people hate politicians. But that's, I didn't invent the game. You know, that's the game that, that, that we're playing. You know, you try and play by the rules of that game, unfortunately. And so those are some of the things I think that are worth considering, especially if you're coming into the advocacy world. Like, Quite often, you're kind of having to make these deals that people on the outside or people on the more activist side will be very annoyed at you at, but you just have to kind of figure out what you're doing that's best for the, the, the movement overall. Um, all right, I'll move on to the next slide. The media. Okay, so I think this is kind of like a part where I really want to get into, you know, what you can talk about going and meeting the politicians and the advocates and like all that sort of stuff. Um, 
kind of doing these like introducing legislation and the hearings and all that. But I said before, like one area, and I, I I've been doing drug policy advocacy for five years. And I think it took me sort of like two or three years to realise like going up and doing meetings. So my day to day life. In, in, in DC is like I'll go and do meetings with like politicians and staff advisors and politicians and sit down and talk to them about a law and stuff like that. But the value of that versus the value of like talking in the media about the issue and talking about the issue in a way that's like specifically aimed at the politician is just like night and day because they really, you know, me in a room sitting saying like, please support this law, Senator X versus like an op opinion piece in a big newspaper in their state or in their district or in their like neighborhood, in their community. Um, the impact is just so much bigger because these guys, like politicians, right? They have, you know, like, you get like a Google search, right? A Google alert. I don't know if anybody's ever used like Google alert. They will have Google alerts for their name, right? That will come up every day. They'll have staff that monitor communications and they are really, really, care about what's said about them in the media and they'll read if, if you mention their name, they'll read about it in the media. And it doesn't matter who it is, if it's like Boris Johnson or Nicholas Sturgeon or Jeremy, like from the top to the bottom, you know, all these people will care about um you know what's said from the media. And so the media, like it's not like a universal thing. You have different ways of engaging the media. Um and again like I want to just say this 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 for me is like one of the most overlooked but yet important tools of advocacy is like how do you engage the media as an advocate? How do you get the media on your side? And so there's different ways of doing that. One is kind of op-ed or like opinion pieces, you know, and I've got posted, found this like fake one about the, the Guardian website about, oh, Joan wrote an op-ed about the Bush and I'm putting too early on the bus, it's a fake opinion piece, but that sort of thing, the kind of these kind of articles that you'll see in the newspapers when you click to these pages, they will very often take like public submissions, like submissions from members of the, of the public and from advocates, you know, about certain topics. Um, and so that's a way of like engaging, right? And so to give you an example, right? If I wanted, uh, you know, Senator Smith, right? To support cannabis legalization, right? I have this cannabis legalization legislation that I've worked on. It's been introduced, right? It's working its way through. And Senator Smith is the powerful committee chair, right? I'm definitely going to go and meet with Senator Smith and his staff and talk to him about it. I'm definitely going to sit, I'm going to give him the fact sheets. I'm going to sit down. But I'm absolutely going to find somebody in his district, in his neighborhood, in his backyard to write an op-ed, to write an opinion piece. And it isn't going to be Michael Collins from Drug Policy Alliance because he doesn't care about Michael Collins. It's going to be police captain who supports it. And it's going to be an opinion piece that says, you know, Senator Smith has to support this legalization. It's going to lay out the case, but it's going to mention his name and it's going to mention the legislation because I want that guy to be eating his cornflakes in the morning and pick up the newspaper, see his name, and then be like, what's this about? What, what's going on here? What, do I need to support this? What is this thing? And like, am I getting pressure? And who's... The police captain says I should support it. And so maybe that will, you know, that's just like such a very, very, very impactful way of changing a politician's mind. And again, I talked to you before about like what motivates them and, and, and it's getting reelected, right? And it's moving up the ladder and it's the media coverage. And they don't want to have a police officer. I'm using the example of a police officer, but it can be a doctor or, a, you know, it can be like, you know, somebody... Uh, <coughs> In recovery, it can be whoever, it can be me or you, but they don't, they want to be in the media in a positive light. They don't want to be getting pressured and they don't want to be called out for something. And so the extent that you can do that in these media pieces is very helpful. And so you've got opinion pieces, which is a kind of like 500, 600 words that you'll see. And every newspaper has them, um, local level, national level. Like that's the kind of one example that you'll see from The Guardian, for example. You've got like now the good thing from an advocacy point of view is you have like the print media, right? Where it's like you buy your newspaper every day and you sit and read it old school. But now you have like there's only a limited amount of space in a newspaper. They have two or three of these pieces. If you go on like the Guardian comment is free website, they're literally updating it every hour. 
the new opinion pieces, like they need material, right? They need people writing for them so that they can. And it's not just the Guardian; it's Huffington Post and all sorts of these publications that exist online. And there's a proliferation of these kind of online spaces where, as advocates, you can really get your voice and your message out there um, and, 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 and impact. So you got opinion pieces. You've got letters to the editor, which is like typically, you know, let's say for example, you're campaigning in Newcastle for a safe consumption mm -hmm. space, right? A safe injection. What do you guys call it here? A safe consumption space or a safe injection facility? Drug consumption. Say, huh? Drug consumption. A drug consumption room. So my American vernacular can do it. <laughs> a drug consumption room. Um, say you're campaigning for a drug consumption room, and that's the, the number one thing, right? And you've, you know, you've done the kind of got the legislation introduced for it or something like that. And then an article comes out about, you know, overdose rates in Newcastle are skyrocketing and some reporters written it. You should be responding to that article with a letter to the editor. It's 100 words, 150 words. And you should be saying like, you know, I saw the article, I read the article with interest, blah, blah, blah. The solution to this is, or one of the solutions that has to be on the table is drug consumption rooms, drug consumption rooms. And here's why the evidence shows, and they've tried it in Canada, and they're doing it something like that, and and you get it up, you know, you you, you really mm -hmm. increase your chances of getting it published. Um, <clears throat> then there's kind of uh, a lot of the other like generic things about like press releases. A press release is basically, you know, when you have news as an organisation or like an advocacy group, if you have like something you want. To Tell the media about or you want to respond to a press release is a good way of doing it so let's say like the new statistics for overdose rates come out in newcastle and they're really terrible or something like that you can do a press release that's basically like you know new overdose statistics you know are uh, you know demonstrate a need for drug consumption rooms and like blah 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 and all that sort of stuff and then you have like a quote from you know, Michael Collins from Drug Policy Alliance says, like, blah, blah, blah. And I talk about politicians not wanting to do a lot of work. I hope there's no journalists in the room either. Because journalists as well, like, they also like to be spoon-fed things, right? They want to be, you know, they want their work to be made easier. And they're sitting and they're like, God, I have to write this, like, 500-word article about overdose rates. And a wee press release arrives in their inbox, and it has a quote. I might just plug, I'm going to copy and paste that quote and just plug it in my story. And boom, there you go. There's Michael Collins in that article in the, you know, the, the, the Guardian or whatever, talking about, uh, you know, the issue and framing it from our point of view and getting our message across. And that's very successful. Press conferences, talked about earlier on, you know, kind of arranging, um, you know, getting media to come. That's a little bit more challenging than getting media and inviting them to like a certain event talking about the issue from your point of view and having different spokespeople there. Um, teleconferences, it's the same thing except it's over the phone. So you send out to the media or journalists like different, uh, you know, announcing that you're going to have this press conference over the phone and you have different people there. Um, sign on letters, again, like it's a useful tool for getting out there in the media because you can have like, you know, a hundred Newcastle doctors support, you know, safe consumption, so drug consumption rooms. Um, and, 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 and you send that out to the media and it's all these, you know, doctors have signed on in support of a letter, you know, and the letter's been sent to Newcastle City Council or whatever. That's going to be something that maybe the media wants to write about, right? You know, maybe they want to cover that story and maybe they want to call you up. So these are just kind of different ways of like talking about the media. I'm going to drill down a little bit through the next slide. Can I just ask a question? Absolutely, yeah. Um, just in relation to talking to the media, the thing I'm always concerned about is it actually damages your relationship with the government. So if you're working relationship with you know, policy, people within the policy units and within the government ministers and things, then making a press release and having a press release about activities that may be going against government policy or challenging the government sure. in some way, I always just get a bit worried that they're not going to answer the emails and the phone after this. Um, well, I mean, I, 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 so I'm going really to try and I'll hopefully get into that in this okay. slide. Um, but just to respond directly to that, I don't think you need to necessarily, I don't think you're always like challenging government when you do like a press release or when you do, I don't think you're necessarily 
you know, going to piss people off. I mean, if you're like, write a press release and you're like, I was in the room with Jeremy Corbyn and he said to me, Theresa May is a giant shit or something like that, and like, blah, blah, blah. It's probably going to be a wee bit annoyed that you released that information, you know? So, again, it's like sort of, you have to be smart and realise, like, what can you share and what can you not share? And it is a fine line, right? Sometimes, you know, and I'll talk to this about, I get to that there about sharing intel. Sometimes you need to do stuff anonymously, right? And do kind of like, leak information and do not all that dirty games and stuff like that. Sometimes you need to do that. Sometimes you might want to do that to advance your agenda. But again, like my, my, my experience is I would not, you know, when I'm talking about writing like an op-ed or an opinion piece about, you know, cannabis legalization or something like that, and I'm calling out, you know, a politician, right? I'm sort of highlighting them. I would never write, you know, Senator Smith is the worst guy ever because he doesn't support cannabis and here's why he's an idiot and he's an absolute donkey and blah, blah, blah. Because they're definitely not going to call you out. They're not going to call you back. You're not going to get in the room with them. You're trying to like gently sway them and you're sort of like... And honestly, like, I f my experience is I find that if, they, if, the, if, the, if the, the, the politicians or the government think that you've got a good media game, they talk, they keep them on side, right? Because I don't want them out in the media calling me Jeremy Corbyn just called Theresa May. I, you know, I, I, I think they want you sort of, uh, they want you on side and they'll respect you for that, right? And they'll respect your advocacy game a little bit more. Um, so, I mean, again, I'm going to hopefully get into that a little bit more here, but this is more, one of the kind of, uh, I mentioned like reporters, journalists, they can, you know, they're hard working people and I think like, they're not subject matter experts. That's something that's very important to understand. So Monday, they're writing about, you know, the, 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 the uh, you know, they'll be writing about the peace from the East. Tuesday, they're writing about, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the kind of latest overdose report. Wednesday, they're writing about what happened in Coronation Street last night. You know, they're not experts on the drug policy issue, which is what we are, right? We in this room. You know, regardless of what you may think about yourself, you're more of an expert than the journalists, right? And so what, when they write articles, they always want to hear from experts, right? And they want these kind of quotes that they can just plug into their article that make them sound like they talk to somebody who's in the know. And so it's a very important thing, you know, as an advocate to figure out, like, who writes on your issues, right? So if you're in at the national level and the, in, 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 if you're working at the national level, who at the national level and all the national level newspapers writes on drug policy or criminal justice and like you can find that out quite easily just by sort of searching through the articles on Google and figuring out like who's the journalist. And I, you know, this new organization that I work for in Spain, like I'd never worked on like Spanish drug policy, but we were doing a campaign around cannabis legalization. And what I did was I just put together like an Excel spreadsheet and one list, one one column was the kind of all the newspapers in Spain. And then another column was just like the name of the people who've written on like cannabis in the last 12 months. And then after that, it's kind of like the email addresses, right? And so you just try to figure out like, who do you know that writes in this issue? And there'll be some people who just write about it in passing and they get some people who like, they're always the guy that writes about drug policy, right? You know, whatever newspaper it is, they always write about criminal justice or they always write about, you know, harm reduction, whatever it is. And so figuring that out, I think is really important for Pitching reporters is basically like what when I say pitching reporters, it's basically like trying to get a reporter to cover your story, right? And so once you have that list of names and the email addresses and all that, like that's who you should send your press release to, right? So you have the press release about you know the overdose rates and the solution is the drug consumption room. You should be sending that press release to, um, you know, you should be sending that press release to that group journalists, right? And the hope is that they will then cover the story or they might call you up or they might, uh, you know, include your quote in their story. And that way, you know, as an from an advocacy point of view, you're getting your position out there. Um, giving a scoop, it's not always an easy thing to do, but, you know, if you know about like a piece of legislation that's coming down the line, if you know, if you're working on this like uh, cannabis legislation that's coming out that's going to be like a big deal or something like that, giving a little heads up to a journalist, it helps build the relationship with the journalist. That they're like, hey, you might want to know about this, it's coming out tomorrow, like blah, blah, blah. 
And that often is good because not only will they write in the story, but they'll sort of like include your point of view and often like write the story that you would, the way you would want them to write it versus just like writing about it willy nilly, right? So you can really shape it. Sharing intel, we talked about that with Anna just now, like it's off, you know, it's, you can do it off the record, you can do it on the record, you always need to be careful. But if you learn something like in a meeting or if you learn something about something that's coming down the line and you want to give a heads up to someone in the media, they can write an exclusive about it. Like, that's what they love to do. They love to write these articles that are exclusive and have juicy details and stuff like that. Um, the other way is like, you sort of like, I think it's important to generate your own media on an issue. It doesn't, there's not always going to be an overdose story, you know, about statistics like every day. These maybe come out once a year or something like that. So I think like create your own media. So like organisations like Drug Policy Alliance will do our own reports on certain issues and then we'll go and promote the report and send that survey out um sorry send that report out we'll do surveys like 90 percent of people are in favor of drug consumption room blah 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 these are the kind of things that you see in the media and the media i mean your average journalist is getting to work every day and he doesn't know what he's going to write about and if you give them a story to write about you know then you're making their job easier right and you're giving them the quotes and you're talking to them and you're kind of like being the expert and that's the kind of stuff that they want to do um, and that's what I talk about like make their job easy and try and be helpful like not only should you be sort of like sharing all the details about the story but maybe I'll connect you like with a doctor as well and like I'll connect you with like a law enforcement official and kind of making their job easier so that they can write the story um, sometimes stories will come out of the blue uh, especially like in an online capacity that are like a new a brand new story about like overdose rates and some guys just bashed out a generic story, all those rates are really high, Newcastle, blah, 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 right, the end, and it's online. If you can get in touch with that journalist and say, oh, I saw your, you know, I saw your article about overdoses, like, here's our perspective, here's our press release, here's a quote you might want to include, blah, blah, blah. Quite often, um, they will be uh, responsive to that and include it. It's kind of like, they can update it. It's, it adds more content, the story adds more context. And so it can be really helpful. Um, you know, I talked about being reactive and proactive and that's sort of like just what I was talking about before. Sometimes you're reacting to a story that's come out, right? Sometimes you're shaping a story. Sometimes you're sort of feeding the journalist the information. Um, this was like a quote from me that was from a journalist in The Guardian. Basically, like she came to my office, she wanted to write a story about Trump and the war on drugs. And she came to my office, we spent like an hour talking. Um, and I gave her like a whole load of information about the war on drugs and stuff like that. And um, she included like one quote from me on the story, which makes me, that makes me sound like really smart. So I was pleased about that. It's always good to sound smart in a newspaper. My mum's always really pleased. But she also, the story was kind of covered. I gave her a lot of like background information. Um, she included in the story, right? She didn't attribute it to me, which was fine, but it meant the story was kind of very sympathetic to like our point, my point of view, my organization's point of view, a drug policy point of view. Um, you know, she then, once she left my office, before she wrote the story, like, hey, can you put me in touch with anybody who is in law enforcement? I think, you know, I was very helpful and so on. And the story ended up, it was one of these very long, like, Guardian, I can send along to people if they're interested, but it was about, like, it was kind of came out like about or something like that but the whole story was just a very good overview a very smart and well-written piece on like the drug war in the u.s like in the age of trump and i thought it was a good example of like when you work with a journalist very closely you can get you know the kind of story that is, that is favorable to your issue if you're going to be helpful and if you're going to sit down with them and take time and connecting with people and all that sort of stuff um that's it about reporters Yes, your question. Uh, uh, so, so you you had your thoughts on politicians that you've met, you know, they're pretty narcissistic, yeah. they want power. Have you got any thoughts on your your experience with journalists and reporters? Then? Yes. I mean, it's funny, like, I, I think... <coughs> I just think they're not subject... I mean, I think, like, they're not subject matter experts, right? And so whoever is the person they talk to for the story, that is the direction the story will go in. So, like... I mean, I used to, I, I, I used to get the New York Times on a Sunday, right, when I was living in the US, and I'd read a story about Yemen, right, and I'd be like, oh, that must be what's happening in Yemen, right? 
now having like pop the journalist, unless I don't know, it'd be like fake news media and all Donald Trump and stuff like that. But it is very it's not surprising, it is possible to like manipulate the media in a lot of ways that will like you know, I think I'm doing for a good cause, you know, but like I've definitely seen I've pitched reporters on certain stories and basically I could have written it myself the way it's turned out, you know. And that means like I think you know that means I'm sort of now like when I read a story in the news about Yemen or Iran or Iraq or something like that, I'm a little bit like, mm, well, who's talking to this reporter about this and who's <coughs> the you know, who's the, the whose agenda is being pushed here and like you see certain quotes from people and you're like, Oh, okay, that person and sometimes in the the, the realm of like drug policy as well, sometimes you see some very frustrating stories about, you know, something like cannabis, for example, and where it's like, ah, oh, you know, I talked to Dr. So-and-so and they said it's going to kill you if you do this and what, and you get really annoyed about it. But, you know, that's just, so I guess, like, you sort of, my opinion of, like, journalists is, like, they're very important in terms of, like, getting message out there in the public. They're very important because of, like, the power of the media in terms of influencing politicians. But they're also, like, but they're very susceptible to being manipulated, and sometimes that's helpful um but you know sometimes it's, it goes against you as well and you just have to be careful i'm just going to sort of like extend on what you were saying but as well as a little just to reply that one of the is that when you come and read like a quote by him yeah he, yeah i know he's the, the, the he talks about and journalism and stuff like that where they've got like head stories to you know and it's, yes. it's like they've got more pr yeah. workers sending out copy yeah. and it's just like the, the the absolute restriction where they don't get the copy yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I think maybe like 10, 20 years ago, you had the kind of like intrepid journalist who was yeah. like hanging out at the city council and getting the story and hunting down the leads. And you know, nowadays it's like Huffington Post where they'll publish anything, you know, like they will, you know, if you send them like a new press release and you send them, yeah, they, they just they're under a lot of pressure. And what you hear a lot is like content is king, right? They don't get judged on like the quality of their stories, they get judged on the amount that they produce. And, trying to direct traffic for ads and all that kind of stuff that I don't fully understand. But within that, it's like an opportunity from an advocacy point of view to like, they're looking for content, here's some content, you know, like, here's a press release, here's this story, like, why don't you write about this? And like, you know, I say like, you're kind of like being, doing, being proactive. And I think one of the things you'll do if you're good at this advocacy uh, strategy is you'll start to cultivate relationships with the media. Right, and you sort of like have journalists that are like, all right, there's a story about marijuana. I'll call Michael Collins. He knows about this. I'll get a quote from him. Or like a story about sentencing. I'll call Michael. He knows about this, and you start becoming the kind of go-to person for that journalist about you know a certain issue. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and um, I just tweeted, you know, great story, but saying to see this shame to see the same old faces being trotted out for response. And within like a few hours, I had the reporter getting back to me. He's like, "Oh, great, can you get a response?" And now I'm the go-to person for that yeah, report. Yeah, great. And we've got a good relationship. Yeah, you know, so it's just interesting. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. I imagine they'll call you up for context. Like, yeah. what do you think yeah. about this? And like, hey, I've given a few opinion pieces. Yeah, 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 it's great. It's 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 fair. I mean, you raise something that I don't do often enough, which is like, and I'm not sure whether I advise this, but your Twitter now, you can talk to journalists directly. I mean, I don't use Twitter often enough because I don't want my life to divorce me. I'm on the internet enough. But I know a lot of colleagues will sort of like comment directly to journalists on stories kind of what you did and they respond or like, they'll just be tweeting out about stuff in general. And then, you know, the the, the journalists will follow them on Twitter and then it's like, oh, I'll talk to like this guy for, you know, stories about heroin or something like that, and so you become that sort of like trusted source. So there's, there's, it's a good point you raise, especially like on social media now about how you can interact with the kind of mainstream media in general. It's a, it's a way that I've seen you know be very effective. Um, and again, like media as well. Like if someone writes like a good story about something, it's always good to follow up and be like, "You really covered that well. Good job." They like a good pat on the back, especially from the experts. You know, they don't want to just be like attacked. I think politicians and media are very used to like public, you know, the public attacking them and calling them all sorts of names and stuff like that. So they do respond to some 
positive reinforcement hugger joints. Um, <laughs> all right, so. Michael, the, like, yes, go ahead. Yeah, maybe we were talking to journalists. I think it's just interesting we have a policy at the consortium. So you can aware that I had that you do talk to the media. We actually have a policy in place because they're just not ready and they just don't get it right. right. Despite all that and the relationships, we put their own slant <clears> on it. Um, and we have been trying to experiment because mm -hmm. we understand the value of getting it out there and, and, and getting more coverage. Mm -hmm. um, but just the very lack, they don't want to know about people getting better. That's mm -hmm. the truth. Yeah. They mm -hmm. want to see people lying in the pool with a needle hanging out their head. Mm -hmm. That's what's their excuse. And until that mindset shifts um, into the good news stories, then I, I don't know if we can do so. But it doesn't seem to be that in like recovery mm -hmm. public information is benefited from these and not engaged with the media and they go this all the time. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's yeah. had an adverse reaction. It's yeah. the opposite reaction. Because we just don't know you're not. We've we've tried, we've got um and if people are in recovery, then we would trust them more to to, to give a more accurate picture of, of what's happening. Um, Way hard to get. What? Aye, it does actually. <laughs> But there is something about just saying this is so toxic that we're not going to engage with it, yeah. and I and I think that takes a lot of courage. Yep. But do you know, I would rather like I would never do any like Daily Mail, and I know yep. people do it, and I don't judge them for it. But as recovering justice, it's like what you're almost there's something like you can't do that stuff and not become team builders. It's hard. No, it's yes. good. It's good to raise this because I think like. Um, a couple of things. I think none of none of this like stops people from doing things like opinion pieces and all that. Because then you do a yard. Most of the time, you're getting your own message out there, and it's like unfiltered, right? But you do. There is some parts of the media. I mean, we have like in the US, like Fox News, right? And um, you know, we've been contacted like a couple of times. In fact, you know, I, I've been on like <coughs> CNN and like BBC and stuff like that. And you go on and you sort of like you do you prepare your talk you're going to go on Fox News, it's like get the, the, the helmet on and you know, it's got the, the military <laughs> uniform on. I'm going to be my tank because you're really going in a war zone, you know. And it's like a sleepless night before you do that because you know, I think like, um, they want you always want you to come on to talk about like the kind of like the way they frame the issue is the worst way, yeah. you know. They're like, sort of like, uh, who did they want us to come in and talk about? Um, something about like drug dealers. Should drug dealers be shown compassion or something like that? And it was kind of like, so. kind of like you know that like if you go out in the street today, you're like should we show drug dealers compassion? They're like absolutely not. And, you know, trying to like talk talk about an issue with like nuance and all that, it's not going to work in Fox News when you've got all those like people shouting it's at you Fox and stuff on. like that. It's Fox. It's Fox owned by Mother. Fox is owned yeah. by Mother. Yeah. 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 You can do things in preparation to mitigate that, though, because you can ask the person booking you to get to be interviewed, who will I, who will I be debating? Yeah. What is the title of yeah. the yes. pro, of the subject? How long do I have to speak? Yeah. And you can then plan your strategy around that information. They won't withhold that information yeah. from you. They That's will true. give it to you, so you can arm yourself. And, it, and again, it's like it's, it's, it's the choice of yourself or your organisation about how you want to engage, and if you don't want to talk to like certain politicians, uh, certain um, journalists and stuff like that, and again, again, like that extends to like, I mean, like, there's there's certain like politicians that we, you know, you, you don't want to work with, and I don't want. To, I mean, I was saying last night, like, you know, when we with the Obama administration, you know, I remember like we were doing a lot of work with them on sentencing reform, and you know, we would get invited. White House, like every week and all that, it was a lot of fun. You know, you go in the meetings and all that, and all that. Now, I, th I think, like, if we got invited by the White House to go and talk about drug policy, I think, I don't think we would go because I don't think we want to be seen. And like me and Donald Trump in the office doing the wee Trump thing that he always does, and all that. <laughs> oh, I just met Michael Collins, my granny's Scottish, and like, so good. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I think that would be the end of me, you know, even if it was like, I a good conversation with Mr. Trump, but um, <coughs> it's just these are things that you've got. I mean, the good points are raised with both the media and politicians about like knowing when to engage and how to engage. I think you've got the Daily Mail as well, and um, there are some places where you're like the stories are so toxic and the journalists are so awful that you just don't even bother. 
But I mean, I'm trying to talk here about places where you can engage with people, you can engage with it. Another thing as well is like sort of think about like if you don't engage Fox News and if you don't go on Fox News, right? Who are they going to get on instead? They're going to probably get on somebody worse, you know, and they're going to get some donkey on there who's going to say it. And so it's like a kind of if it's not you saying the thing that you want to say, then it's going to be somebody else you know, saying the opposite sometimes. And so you've got to think about like what's the missed opportunity there, maybe to reach an audience, and maybe it's a you know one percent of that audience that might listen to you. Um, but don't you think so? Something like the Daily Mail, they're, all they do is it's like based in hate and fear <coughs> and scapegoating. So we could absolutely engage with them, and then they would be like, "Oh, Trump users, we love them now." Who are we then passing that on to? And I'm actually quite willing to sit with that discomfort with those kind of vile publications <laughs> and, and not pass it on. What do you mean pass it on? Well, so if if it became if you you could have a concerted effort and they could then suddenly and, and I think where, where it would move is not like oh drug users are not bad people, they're sick people. So we could absolutely sell ourselves as sick, as traumatised. We could put a whole lot of stories in at that. They're just going to go for migrants. Yeah. Or they're going to go for some other yeah. group. And I'm actually, So that's what I mean about, like, I'm not willing to engage right. with them and yeah. I'm not willing yeah. to pass yeah. the hate pass and the fear on to some other group. No, no I, don't it's, think it's, I mean, again, like, it's, it's all very fair. And I think, like, um, I don't, I'm not advocating for him to sit down with the Daily Mail. I wouldn't want that in my worst enemy. But, um, I think, like, one of the things I think that does differentiate, like, activism and advocacy is sometimes you have to sit down in the room with people that you don't like, people that you don't agree with on, like, 99% of the issues, but maybe this 1%. And a lot of, like, you know, I showed the guy before, um, Rand Paul, the, the libertarian from Kentucky. You know, in my own personal life, I probably don't agree with, like, anything that he stands for. You know, he's, you know... Low taxes and no money for you know corporations being able to do what they want and doesn't believe in climate change and all that sort of stuff, but he does very firmly believe in like ending the drug war and believes in like criminal justice reform, and he's like, I, I cannot just work with like Michael Collins clones to get something done because there's there's just not the numbers there in terms of and again at the end of the day. We'll try to pass legislation, right? So you're trying to get to a majority, and if you're going to have to work with Democrats and Republicans. You're going to have to like get some conservatives to support you. You know that's kind of you're going to have to cobble together like your coalition, unless you're very lucky and it's like you have the one party who's behind you, and like, you only need to work with that one people. And you know it's uh, Jeremy Corbyn and his super majority in five years from now, and it's like you know unless it, unless that sort of stuff happens, quite often you're going to have to sit down with people you don't agree with. And these are very difficult, um, you know, I talked about like, Trump and the White House and stuff like that, sort of extreme examples, but there's all, there's people within our organisation and our movement who definitely don't agree with us like, sitting down with Republicans at all, and people who hate Democrats and hate all politicians and shouldn't even talk to them at all, what the hell are you doing and all that sort of stuff. But these are kind of, I think the calculation, as I said before, is like, you always got to be like, I'm, Am I moving things forward, even if it's incremental, without selling out my own values and all that? You know, and like I remember being in a meeting where um, the Republican office, and I was talking to them about like, well, we should let marijuana legalization go forward because you know we don't want the government coming in and sort of telling people what to do with their bodies. And I was trying to use my conservative speak, you know, about like don't tell us what to do with our bodies. You know, government stay out of my life. And she was like, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, I think the government shouldn't be telling people what to do. I mean, now they're telling gay people to get married, and that's disgraceful and all this. And I was like, ah, I think I need to go. You know, like, so it's kind of like, um, you really need to be careful about like who you work with and making sure that, like, although they don't represent all your values, they don't take you like in, a, in, a, in, a, in the opposite direction and they don't set you back and they don't you in terms of your overall objective of like moving forward and drug policy reform and those again like it's not an exact science it's like a judgment you make and, and, and sometimes you get it wrong but it's just something that's also a 
Um, is there anything else on that? So moving on. So this is more getting into like how to write an opinion piece, and I think a lot of people will be like, I know how to write an article. Give me a break, Michael. But these are sort of some of the things that I do. We have internet here. Okay, okay, cool, because I'm going to click on a link to show. So, talk before. <laughs> uh, that's a whole presentation falls apart. <laughs> no, um, I think some of the, the, the things like writing opinion pieces are a place where you have control of your own message, right? And you can reach like a big audience. You get like, you know, a certain amount of time and, and space, some, at least 500 words to say what you want to say. And you can be very impactful. Um, so, one of the things I was working on recently was um, this program. I was trying to get the, the national federal government to fund uh, a diversion program called Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, um, which I think is somewhat similar to like the Checkpoint program, but it's a sort of program that's led by law enforcement, but it's all involves a lot of harm reduction and gets people into kind of uh, away from the criminal justice system, it's a, it's it's like a drug court except better. It's kind of like it doesn't involve judges and all these prosecutors and stuff like that. Anyway, my project was to try and get these politicians to support this and ultimately fund it, right? And so the first thing you do is sort of like follow what the publication requirements say, right? If they say five hundred words, sometimes they'll say. You find a section on most websites, right? The Guardian, you know, I'm using the Guardian as an example, but every local newspaper, you know, the Daily Record or whatever, like they all have a little section where you can send in your own opinion. And if they don't, you should email them and ask, like, hey, can I send an opinion piece? Um, but you have to follow, you should follow the publication requirements, right? So maybe they'll say 500 words, include the headline, send a photo, send like a four by four, blah, blah, blah. So that's just a very simple thing. The other thing is like using the right spokesperson, right? Me, Michael Collins from Glasgow, telling a politician to support a diversion program is an absolute waste of time because I don't have, as much as I would like to think, I don't have the gravitas and the authority in this politician to really care what a guy from Glasgow has to say. So you're trying to find the right <coughs> um, spokesperson and quite often, you know, if you're targeting somebody Finding someone from their constituency is very important, right? Because that's who votes for them, right? Finding someone who's like a prominent person. And by that, I mean, they're just in a kind of influential position. And so for this piece, I use someone who is like a defense lawyer, right? I kind of what you call it, a public defender <coughs> um, who works on like defending, um, you know, people who are like alleged to commit crimes. So has a lot of experience working with like drug users and drug sellers, and this she she I felt was someone who was very going to be very helpful in kind of getting the message to the politician, someone who the politician would listen to, and in the in the uh, I wrote to this person and I think I got introduced to them somehow, and I wrote to them I was like, hey, listen, I'm trying to get funding for this diversion program. You know, would you be interested in writing an opinion piece about it, I'm happy to do the first draft. And that's very important because I basically offered to ghostwrite the piece for them, right? Because if someone writes to you and says, hey, do you want to appear in a newspaper? I'm going to write the piece for you versus like, hey, do you want to write a file? Because I don't have time to do that. I mean, like, these people are busy. Like, so you're trying to, it's a lot of what I'm talking about today, whether it's the media or the politicians, Think about ways that you can do the work for them so that they really just need to do the bare minimum because then you'll be more effective in terms of like getting what you want uh, to be done. <coughs> and so I offered, you know, hey, can, you know, would you be interested in doing this? I'm happy to write a draft for you and I'll send it over to you for approval and you can make some edits and stuff like that. And they said, like, absolutely. And that's good because, like, not only are you offering to do it, but you also get, a control. even though your name is not on the piece, you get control of the message. Right, and so in the piece, you're always going to mention the politician by their name. That's very important because otherwise, you can write a good piece in Newcastle about like uh, drug consumption rooms and how they should be approved. But if you how do you, if you don't mention the politician that you're targeting, right? That you want to support, they'll never they 
chances are they're not going to read it. Certainly they're not going to think it impacts them. You know, they're just not. So if you mention the politician, you know, Jeremy <coughs> Corbyn or whatever, then they're more likely to pick it up and read it. As I said before, all these guys are complete evil maniacs and have like alerts about when their name is mentioned in the press and stuff like that. And they love reading about themselves in the press. So the other thing is like making it timely and making the issue local, right? And so I mean, I'm, this this was something that um, the, the diversion program, we were targeting a senator from New Hampshire who was on a very influential committee that was in charge of funding, right? She was in charge of money. So we wanted her to like, get on board with approving funding for this diversion program, right? And so I couldn't just write an op-ed that was like, hey, senator, how about you fund this program? It's great, blah, blah, blah. You have to make the issue um, seem timely, right? So in New Hampshire, they're having like big opioid overdose problems just now. And so linking the program to that was very important. Also making sure it was a local focus, it was a local person writing it was very important. But also like newspapers, they're not going to, generally speaking, Nick Davies' story aside, they're not going to publish press releases, right? They're not going to publish everything that you want. So you have to kind of make it look a little bit organic. Right, you have to kind of look at, make it look as if like, hey, I'm just writing this piece and I just casually mentioned the senator here and I casually mentioned this issue, but actually it's all about the opioid epidemic when in reality it's actually about this one program, right? And so then you're sort of contacting the newspaper and pick. So if we can, can we click on that link? So this was, a, I just wanted to show you an example of this kind of like put into practice. It's terrible if the light goes broken and didn't appear. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got plan B? Have we got plan B? Yeah. <laughs> if, if this doesn't work? Yeah. I've it's got, it's come up on the screen here, but it's... I think it's exit, maybe exit out. Maybe can we copy and paste that or something like that? I've lost my arrow gone. I've lost my arrow. Can you press the escape? Yes. Alex, can you... So it's, it's By pressing the escape. Did you press escape? Try. Oh, there we go. Is that off? No. Oh, it's not on. I can get it on the screen. Stand by for the <laughs> presentation was going so well. Are you aware the arrows right now? There you go. Oh. Um, so, so we'll go down to the PowerPoint. Yeah. And I think close it. It's been censored. Oh, oh, there we go. All right, so I'm going to just show this. Let me get rid of that weak thing there. So this was just like an op ed that I did write. Um, and it's like, a, you know, Catherine Cooper, she's like a defense lawyer, right? And it's like, the title is about, I'm, I'm talking about this program called Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, right? I uh, don't mention it. And Catherine, so not me, because Catherine wrote it. Catherine doesn't mention it. She talks about the opioid epidemic, blah, blah, blah. We need new strategies for the opioid epidemic, blah, blah, blah. Only in like the fourth paragraph that I start mentioning the program. Hey, by the way, there's this new program. It's called this diversion program. So I'm trying to be a little bit subtle, and that's because like, I want it to seem more <coughs> I don't want it to seem to the, the newspaper that like, hey, I'm just using you guys to promote my own agenda, which is what I'm totally doing. <laughs> um, so I talk, then I start talking about weed, blah, blah, blah. Then in the penultimate paragraph, I'm like, Senator Jean Shaheen, she's really great. It would be great if she could support this. She's like been really supportive on opioid issues. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, the play, I'm not winning any prizes for this writing, all right? It's really pretty generic, right? It's a pretty straightforward formula. The point I'm trying to make is just that part there when I say Senator Shaheen, right? That's the you know, that's the bingo moment, right? Because then what happens and what actually happened was I published that, that's in the main newspaper in New Hampshire, right? Literally the next day, you know, I send the the, the I, I, I send to this office to the advisor, like, hey, I was just I saw this. Peace came up, have you seen this? You know, I, I, I sent this to the staffer. 
Aye, we're talking about the office. What can we do? How can we help? The senator is really committed to this issue, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I mean, I'm giving examples. It's not always as easy as this, you know what I mean? Sometimes it doesn't work. But that's how the strategy can work, right? Because they have seen this op-ed. It mentions their boss. She, the senator's read it. They're like, what is this? Tell us more. And I'm like, oh, by the way, I saw this. It looks all very organic, but it's not, right? And that's what I mean about manipulating the media with your own agenda. In the end, we were very successful and managed to get this funding approved. It wasn't like on the back of, you know, one opinion piece, but certainly what I'm trying to show today is like ways in which you can use the media to, to, to fairly uh, spectacular effect. You know, like this was like a, a good example of it. So, if we can be so bold as to go back to the presentation, sorry. I mean, I can just talk, I'll talk well. Uh, Mm -hmm. We're on the. Oh, you want me to get it? So the next part I'm going to talk about anyway is about. So that's the media section we've done. Um, you want me to do it? I'll get it. Yeah, you do. You do it last time. I'm so really good at media. <laughs> well, you know what? Pete's funny because like. People pay close attention to the PowerPoint. There's a bit at the bottom that says September 2010. Huh. And that's because I'm so bad at PowerPoint myself that I couldn't uh, figure out how to scrub the oh. right, an opinion piece. We just did that. Meeting politicians. Okay, so I'm kind of done with the media section. I'm happy to discuss that more. But just underlining, like the last opinion piece is kind of showing how important the media is. In this whole equation and how you can use it successfully. Um, meeting politicians, you know, what you need to do is, you know, obviously set up a meeting with the politicians, find out when, like a lot of in the UK have like subsidy <coughs> hours where they have specific hours to meet their constituents, um, email them, call them, go in with like a mix of people, right? Going in on your own is like, that's cool, this one guy. That baldy Scottish guy with the glasses, he cares about that issue. Going in with a whole crew, it's me, it's the doctor, it's the law enforcement, it's the, the drug user, it's going in with a mix of people is always better, right? Because it shows a diversity of people support the issue. A lot of people make the mistake of going into meetings and just talking about an issue. Hey, you know, heroin and the opioid over the bar. It's very important from an advocacy sort of view to make a request. You need to support this. Please support this legislation. Please make a request. Don't just go in and talk about safe consumption, drug consumption rooms, or whatever they're called. Um, go in and actually say, like, hey, drug consumption rooms, are here. here's what they are. There's a piece of legislation. Can you sign on and support it? Will you support this legislation? Be, be, very, <coughs> be very specific about what your aim of the meeting is. Your aim of the meeting is not to shouldn't be to kind of talk about drug policy with like you know the, the MP it should be like to get them to do something otherwise how do you know you've been successful in the meeting right it could be like they're sitting like listening to you like blah 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 and they're thinking about like oh that was mental what happened in EastEnders last night the only way you're going to know that you're having an impact is if you know they actually do something that you ask them to do right so make an ask right sponsor a bill vote yes on this ask a question the prime minister's questions can you write a letter to like Theresa May about the legal position on drug consumption rooms? That sort of stuff, right? And then also you're sort of like trying to, as I said before, like start a relationship with them. You want to come across as someone who's professional, an expert, who can be trusted, who's going to be working on this issue. Um, and so you're trying to be helpful to them. Like, hey, you know, I'll send you, would you be interested in doing a letter? Great, okay, we'll send you a draft. Of, how about we send you a draft of the letter? Right? Rather than getting them to write the letter, which they know we're going to do. Um, do a follow-up, right? Okay, in two months' time, you know, we'll come back and talk to you about this again, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I'm saying this, I'm repeating myself here, doing them a favour, make the job easier, send them a re send them research, draft letter, blah, blah, blah. Very important, right, in meetings, like, to find out, like, you know, what their position on the issue is. A lot of times you go into a meeting with a politician or a staff member, right? And you're so excited about, I can't wait to convince them about drug consumption rooms, right? You know, have you heard this and it's happening in the Netherlands and there's one in Germany and here's a picture and here's this paper. And then you come out of the meeting and you're like, 
What do you think about drugs in some of the rooms? I don't actually know. Didn't they didn't say it. You know, and politicians are very, 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 very skilled at not saying anything substantive. Absolutely, I hear you. I see where you're coming from. That makes sense. Like all that sort of crap. Um, and that's going to get you nowhere. So you need to give them space to talk. And it's very, it's a difficult skill. I say this as someone who likes to talk a lot. Letting other people talk because then they'll give you information. And even like staying silent as they respond, like getting them to fill the silence, right? Because then they'll start giving you information. Well, you know, I think this is a good idea. Um, but you know, blah blah. And then you start okay. Get a feel of where they stand on the issue, and then you can sort of like make your own judgment in terms of like following up, um, gathering intel from them. Right, the more that you allow them to talk, these meetings are not about you going and talking. Right, these meetings are not about you going and sort of showing how much you know about drugs. Right, the meetings are about gathering information from them. You want to, you want them to talk. You want them to start blabbing their mouths off about well, actually, we could move this issue if like you know. The John Smith, the MP for Newcastle, would get on board. Or you know who the problem is, actually? You need to go and talk to them. You want to get little pieces of intel that you couldn't pick up from the newspaper, that you couldn't pick up from, you know, reading the internet or whatever. Um, if you're going in with a group, right, before the meeting, sit down and say, okay, we've got this meeting from 12 to 1. Everybody does a short presentation, one minute each, and that's it. Because when you go in large groups, right, especially with people you don't know, there's a tendency, there's always one person in the group who loves the sound of their own voice and wants to talk for 20 minutes and thinks that they're giving the bloody one of those UN speeches, you know? And then before you know it, it's like, oh, sorry, your time's up. And other, so you need to figure out that among your group, like letting them know, like, hey, we're here. We're going to do a little bit of talking, but let's let the <coughs> politician talk, or let's let the staff member talk. Um, and that's the last point, knowing how much time you have when you get in a meeting. With the politician, how long, have we, how long have we got, you know, half an hour, an hour, and then figuring out from there, because you don't want to, like, have a meeting where, like, you're already talking for half an hour, and then they're like, oh, sorry, listen, I need to go, raise a maze on the phone, if you want to chat, something like that, you know, you don't want that <coughs> situation to happen, because then, you know, your objective in the meeting is sort of, like, making your ask, and then gathering intel and giving them space, so those are just kind of, like, some tips about doing meetings in a way that's going to make them more successful. Go to the next slide. Okay, so this is like another, like I'm talking about like passing legislation, but quite often as an advocate you'll come up against things that you don't like. And so what you're, this is like a part of the job that's more fun where you're trying to actually kill legislation and stop it from moving. And so I think it's good to get out there when a like, let's say, like, Trump with the death penalty, right, when he said that, you know, we got out there and we really, like, defined the issue as, like, Trump, he wants to be this, like, dictator, like, the guy in the Philippines and this doesn't work, blah, 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 generating a lot of, like, negative press from them, like, using experts, going to their backyard, in other words, like, writing those opinion pieces but not being nice, being a little bit more harsh, getting somebody who's also a politician who can, like, fight with you and stand up with you. Um, and then also, like, it's very unlikely when a politician says something that they're going to, like, back down completely and be like, I was an idiot, that was a stupid idea. They're going to try and find a way out, right? And so if it's, like, a piece of legislation and they're like, you know, 10 year, I'm going to add 10-year sentences for cannabis possession, maybe, like, they're not going to completely go away from that position, but maybe they're like, and rather than that, we're going to study the issue. So, like, trying to think of things like you give them to be like, all right, we don't want you to do that, but what about if you go and have a wee commission? Because commissions always lead to nothing. So stuff like that. Um, so that's killing legislation. Um, we'll go to the next slide. And then I talked about this already. Um, advocacy and activism. This is like a guy who, who worked on like legalizing marijuana in DC. And this is a guy Adam, I got a kind of blurry photo, but he's getting arrested because he went up to Congress and was handing out marijuana and doing like this activisty stuff. Now, I would never do that because that's not my job, but he's very good at that. And like, again, I, I'm, I, I, activism is a very important thing, even for advocacy. It's just difficult, different to know. You know, advocacy, you're inside the room. A activism, you're more outside the room. Advocacy, you're sort of like trying to be respected and get a seat at the 
evil activism. You're kind of like throwing bombs and you don't really care. Um, and it's the sort of character, it's a character, not literally throwing bombs, I don't want to advocate that. Um, character and stick approach is sort of like you're kind of, sometimes what you can do with advocacy and act, working with activists is to be like, listen, we are the sort of adults in the room and those guys outside, like if you want us to hold back the kind of crazy people or whatever, like, you know, you need us and let's work a deal out. But I know you don't want to do what they want to do, but is there a deal that we can make? Because, you know, that sort of stuff. Activism is very good for getting media attention. This guy, Adam, does a lot of, uh, gets a lot of media. Like he does things like he turns up outside the White House in a jail cell and hands out marijuana to people for free and stuff like that. And he gets arrested and he's always in the news and activism is very, very good for that. Sometimes, I don't know why I put desperation actually. <coughs> Um, anyway, we'll move to the next slide, but I just wanted to kind of like highlight some of the differences. And so this is like a case study of like when we managed to like uh, defeat a piece of legislation. Um, this is a senator from New Hampshire who she wanted to expand sentences for, she wanted to increase sentences for selling fentanyl, for possessing fentanyl, which fentanyl some of you know in the US like uh, is being added to heroin is very potent as well. Um, and what we were able to do very quickly, she wanted to say like, well, Prince, I think Prince, Prince died because he took fentanyl and like, we need to stop fentanyl, blah, blah, blah. We were able to get out there and say, well, actually you would put, you, what you're trying to do, we talked to the media about how she would put Prince in jail and this is what she wants to do. And she wants to put people like Prince in jail and isn't this crazy, blah, blah, blah. We worked with this other senator to oppose the issue. We went and we did like opinion pieces in her backyard, like in, in her state and about like how wrong this was. We got law enforcement to talk out. We got doctors to say this didn't make sense, blah, blah, blah. We just really like, it was a lot of fun, man. We just really piled on her issue and she began to worry about like, well, I don't I kind of um, wish that I hadn't even bothered making this suggestion in the first place. We also like through the back channels kind of gave her a way out and said, well, maybe you want to do a study about this and we're happy to support a study, blah, blah, blah. So we found a way so just very briefly, kind of like pointing out like some of this in action, you know, and a lot of what we were very successful about doing wasn't actually me going and meeting the politicians and stuff like that. It was more about getting out in the media. <coughs> that we really embarrassed her. She was running for re-election in uh, New Hampshire in a very, very tight race that has a big opioid, had a big, has a big opioid, but had a big opioid epidemic. And she wanted to be like, I'm doing something about this, blah, blah, blah. And we just like crushed her in her backyard and she was so bad. She ended up losing the election. I don't think necessarily because of us, but she really wished that she hadn't picked this up and bothered touching it because, and it was a message to other politicians as well. Like don't bother touching this issue because you're gonna get crushed and it's just like a stupid thing to do. And again, like sometimes passing legislation is really good, but it's also fun to just like defeat people and like send them a message. It's like I'm Tony Soprano or something like that. Anyway, uh, I do not advocate crushing women. Anyway, move on to the next slide. Um, oh, I just talked through all that. Okay, cool. I'm already ahead of myself. That is, oh, there's, these are some, so this is a good example. Like, these are some of the headlines that we got in her newspaper, her local newspaper, about some of the stuff we did. Like, that's, you saw that already from New Hampshire. Like, these are headlines. She gets pushback. She's pushing penalties. We are like, nearly 100 organisations opposes. She's trying to crack down on Prince. Like, blah, blah. she would repeat the mistakes. Like, these are all. You know, sort of like, this is the wrong way to do this. If you're a politician, right, and you're reading your morning newspapers, you do not want these kind of headlines about yourself. You want people out there saying you're the best thing, especially if you're getting re-elected. And you're it's an absolute nightmare for her, the poor lady. But this is kind of what happened. And, like, you know, we ended up, she ended up withdrawing the legislation and, like, moved, putting it, filing it in a wee draw somewhere. I don't know, wherever she put it. But this is, like, a good example about, like, we were out in the media, we were able to like define the issue, we were able to hide the story, we made it look really bad for her. And again, like it's always good to be on the forefront, like pushing legislation forward, but sometimes you need to like stop bad things from happening as well. And um it's the same sort of strategy for doing it. So it's been similar with Victoria Atkins, hasn't it? Yeah, she thought that happened. Yeah. She thought she was just but she was in Parliament, she thought <coughs> nobody would notice and she said the Canadian government tell her that she needs to make an apology. What did she say? Well, 
Well, what I thought it was more, it was more that she was, she was talking about with cannabis. Well, this was, there's been two. I mean, right, I think I she's going to really... Where she didn't think it would pick up on the fact that her husband was the largest um, grower of medicinal cannabis right. in the UK. Yeah. And went on to talk about the harm of cannabis, oh, and right. it just blew up in her face. Yeah. yeah. But what's the other one you were thinking? She did the same on drug consumption rooms, and she just, I mean, she just absolutely yes, made okay. nonsense up and thought it would go unnoticed, and it didn't. People picked up on it, and then... To say the Canadian government, it was brought up at the UN. Yeah, just the follow up of that was because uh, cause it was Transform, which is part of Emma's child, worked closely with Canada and kind of did amazing things with drug consumption rooms. Um, they, they got in touch with the Canadian people and they wrote a letter saying that basically she was lying and actually, well, it was at the United Nations with the conference on the yeah. drugs. Canada actually pulled, pulled them out and actually gave them a good, basically telling off, which I can get access to that room, but... But I'm sure, I mean, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the stuff doesn't happen organically, I'm sure it's like advocates are feeding the media with this oh, sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, I mean, it's great, I mean, that's, that's kind of like what you need to do, and like, and a lot of these articles, like, some of them I'm quoting, some of them I'm not, but like, it's always the best is like, when it's like, it looks organic, and it looks like mm. the news media's just like picked up on this, and they've taken this angle, because then the politicians really began to begin to worry, but, um, all right, I think for me, maybe the last slide, is it? Yeah. Yes, okay, my final thoughts. So, just some things that we're wrapping up for lunchtime, and I'm sorry I didn't get up, I didn't have to get up to my type of questions, like paying for food and lunch and talk to me and talk, I didn't have to do that. Um, the legislative process, like you're not guaranteed to be successful, right, but if you're not in it, you don't win it. Um, it's a frustrating process, like it's very slow and politicians are terrible and the media is annoying and all that sort of stuff. And politicians suck, as I say at the end. Um, but you know, like I say, like if you're not there, they're going to do this stuff. Bad, good, whatever, and it's important, I think, to be at the table. And then the last thing, if you take away anything today, which I'm happy to elaborate on more, is like the role of the media in all this is very, very important. Like I think... Some people do advocacy and they think it's just like sitting down and meeting with politicians and going home and stuff like that. But if you use the media and you get the media on your side and you use the media effectively, I think you can be really successful. So I'll leave it at that. Then we'll never yep. take yeah. off. Go ahead. Yeah. Just quickly, have you got any thoughts of books that you would recommend for people to go away? This this is a good handbook. You, you can pick some, some good points up from this. Best. Um, I can't think of any books off. Maybe Websites. I should write one. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Inside story. No, um, I can't. This is all stuff I've picked up just like from my own experience over the years, like five years of doing this. Is this stuff online? I can send you guys this presentation yeah. in the notes along with yeah, that. We'll to that. Yeah, I'm yeah. happy to do that. Um, but no, I don't know. I mean, yeah, no, there's not anything that I read or anything like that. I would be like, this is just what you pick up through like personal experience. And again, like this is just like, this isn't something I was like taking from a book or anything like that. There isn't any book on this sort of stuff. And I think that's why it's good to come and do these kind of presentations because there's no way I would even learn this stuff unless you're actually doing it. Yeah. So. Cool. So we've got a short lunch of 12 back here. 12.30 sharp, so I'll be using the teacher voice to get me back in the room. <laughs> Lunch is sandwich and soup, which is served in, if you go out this door and straight ahead, you go into the big studio rooms there. So talk to each other, get each other's contact details. Like I said, I'll send a, send a slideshow out to everybody if you want it, if you can sign in. If you haven't already, you can sign with emails to them to make sure that everybody's got. Um. There will be an audio recording once you. Oh my God! Oh, great. Okay, then, uh, great. Audio, a podcast on how podcast, to do it. Podcast, yeah. Um, so go and have some lunch. Go and speak to each other. Exchange people's names and addresses and contacts. So, so what would it be better or easier if uh, you come to me and, and send them? You know, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you